Hi, welcome to Chapter and Verse. Today I'm going to have a conversation with a, what I call superstar author, Heather Graham, and I don't use that word lightly. Uh, and Heather will be talking about the stories behind her books, her career, and giving advice and tips to writers. Uh, be sure to stay around till the end of the session because I'm going to ask Heather what her number one tip is for writers and authors. I'm Rick Blywis. I'm an award-winning author, and I have a new historical fiction mystery coming out in February called Pinion Scorpion and the Barbershop Detectives. And that's enough about me. And now, hi, Heather. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. So you're in uh, Florida, right? I am in Florida. Yeah, I, I started my college at the University of Miami and lived in Florida. Did you? Years. Yeah, my younger son lives in Florida. My best friends in the world live in Florida. Uh, so I really uh, am attuned to the state from a people standpoint. <laughs> oh, good, yeah, yeah. I I grew up here. My my parents were actually immigrants. My dad's Scottish, mother is Irish, um, mm -hmm. but they met and married in Chicago. And I guess both of them had it with being cold, and they moved to Florida. And uh, and I have have been here, spent my life here. Still love to travel. Um, but, um, hmm. but I like the fact that I'm in a pool, um, as you can tell by the way here, <laughs> in a pool <laughs> almost every day. Um, I, I, I do, uh, I love so much that's near me. So I'm, I, again, absolutely love traveling and seeing other places too, but this is home. So what is the most favorite or a couple of favorite places you've traveled to that you just, oh, best? gosh, that's kind of like asking, which is your favorite child? <laughs> But there are a couple of them. I absolutely um, adore New Orleans. I'm there a great, well, usually I'm there a great deal of the time. Um, I'm fond of Massachusetts because my husband is Italian. His dad was one of 11 and his mother was one of six and he has about 200 cousins. Wow. <laughs> so we, we used to spend a great deal of time going up and down for Massachusetts and we would all go to Salem for many weekends. And uh, the history in Salem to me is spectacular yeah. and how it influenced our government now. Um, so I, I, I do just absolutely love that area. I love Savannah, okay. love Charleston. The be two um, beautiful cities. Yeah, they're just really, really pretty series. I, I love San Antonio. And uh, I have a daughter living in California now. So okay. yeah, that makes me love California a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, and I have a son in Chicago and a son in New York. So, you know, I have to love those too. <laughs> so you do have some traveling to do during the year to see everyone. I do, I do. And I keep asking them, who has children in Florida who move north? <laughs> <laughs> people are supposed to move south, but anyway. But uh, I always want people to be where they're going to be happy. That's that's the most important part. Although it, it does it does kind of hurt lately that, you know, travel's so limited. Um, I would definitely like to see them a lot more and probably usually would have, you know, than I have now. But um, I also love, well, my dad was from Sterling, so I love Sterling. My mom's from Dublin, so I love Dublin. Okay. Uh, uh, Scandinavia. I, I don't know. There's so much I love. Italy, Spain, <laughs> a lot. You named a lot of places that I love as well, although I've never <laughs> been to Scandinavia. Everything you've named, that's about the only place I haven't been. Oh, really? You've got to go. You've I guess. Go. Yeah, will. no, it's fascinating and beautiful. Yeah. Um, it, Russia, I went years ago. I uh, hadn't been out of college very long. And a friend of mine worked for Conoco Oil. And I don't even remember the exact circumstances, but um, I, I wanted to see Russia. And it was still under you know the communist bloc. And it was right. very interesting. But I also found out. I think a lot of it had to do with growing up in Florida. We were always going to be bombed. We were the duck, duck and cover right. kids. Oh, and yeah. so I was like, what people wanted to do this to me. When you meet people, people are almost always the same. Yes. You know, it's, it's usually, you know, I agree. the powers above that, you know, <laughs> make things hard. So people are people. And, and I met a lot of lovely people. So, so oh, Cairo. Sorry, forgot. I wrote. Oh, okay. <laughs> I haven't been there either, but that's a place I definitely wanted to go. Oh, just yeah, it's there. amazing, amazing. Yeah, I'll, I'll bet it is. <laughs> I really bet it is. I love. Well, I think. I think the thing to me that was most interesting is I don't care what picture you see of the pyramids or the Sphinx, you don't have a concept of the size until you're next to them. 
Yeah. So, and then again, and then when I was a little kid, I went to the Field Museum and got terrified by a mummy. Really? <laughs> so, <laughs> Field Museum in Chicago has has a mummy exhibit. Still do. Um, so I, I remember having nightmares about mummies. So it was good to go to Cairo and find out that they, in the Cairo Museum, they're like a dime a dozen. <laughs> you know, kind of sad, really. But anyway. Wow. Well, I, I definitely, Cairo was on my list of to-dos. I just haven't done it yet. Yeah. There's all, oh, there's a, oh, so many more that I'm hoping to be able to get to, you know, in the future. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a sucker for an island. <laughs> okay. Very, very much so love Bermuda, Jamaica. Jamaica is another favorite place. Yeah, I love islands. You're naming some really good places for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, let me go back to uh, before you became a writer, because if I'm not mistaken, your first novel, uh, When Next We Love, was in 80, 1982. Take me before that. Um, so what did you do and how did you get into being a writer? Well, I wound up doing a couple of things. I majored at University of South Florida uh, in theater arts and I loved it. I had a phenomenal time. Uh, worked at the Oslo State Theater, worked a lot of dinner theater, um, some strange commercials. and. Uh, but I also got married right out of high school. And then after college, when we had kids, it was getting very expensive to try to work. And that was when I decided I was going to, uh, loved books so much that I was going to try to write a book. And it went through, I, actually the first, it was funny too, because the first thing I actually sold, my first check was for $15 to Twilight Zone. Oh, really? <laughs> a horror story. Yeah, in, uh, out of Twilight Zone, I believe they were in Canada. And uh, th that was fun, but we, you know, probably weren't going to eat a whole lot on it. <laughs> so um, definitely was trying to get in with books. And uh, as much time as I spent in bookstores and libraries, I wasn't keenly aware of how much at that time a book needed to fit a certain category. Right. Now, I mean, of course, we're still doing, you know, books by category because they have to shelve them somewhere. Right. Exactly. Um, but I think one of the things that um, excites me about now is that we are combining so many more elements in, in, in our novels. Uh, you can have a great adventure, romance, sci-fi, you know, and you can have all kinds of things going on. Yeah. So I'm very grateful for that. But I, uh, in between, uh, once I had, we have five children. So when I had three of them, I was trying to supplement a little bit, so I became a lifeguard on Miami Beach. Really? And then, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I bet you there yeah. were a lot of guys who were tr hoping yeah. to get saved by you. <laughs> yeah. So that, that lasted a couple of weeks, and but then I got certified to teach kids to swim, <laughs> which uh, proved to be, you know, fun and, uh, and useful <laughs> you know, as my second generation is swirling around. Um, and then I did publish and started writing full time. Okay. So did you ever have any rejections or it was everything you oh, said? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is, that's one thing because back in, you know, 1982, everything you did, you were mailing, you know, if you were lucky, you got a phone call and, uh, I think I'd sold one or two books I and mean, you would still get the no, well, this has to be fixed or can you resubmit this? Um, and uh, we had we had formed one of our uh, groups down here. And it was strange because the different people in the writing group would talk about being so excited when you got a rejection slip that was actually signed. <laughs> you know, it wasn't just a copy of rejection. But I think one of the things that's funny too is that I... Uh, I finally broke in with a line that, that I thought was very realistic at the time, or it was a romance line, but more realistic. You might've been divorced. You might've been in love before. You might've, you know, it wasn't just, you know, it was a little bit of uh, more contemporary than the fairy tale, you know, where you just, you know, start off. And I remember when uh, the first book was picked up uh, and I was talking to the editor after, she asked me if I had anything else. And I said, well, yes, I have some things, but they have been rejected. And she said, well, that's okay. I'd like to see them. And it's kind of like, they've been rejected by you. <laughs> she was like, that's okay. We'll see them because they had decided they were going to work with me. Okay. So um, I was very grateful for that. But I'd also, I, I had parents who read everything. 
Uh, I really thank them for the career I have because they never, you know, they weren't the kind who were like, oh my God, that's a comic, put it down, you know, read something. Right. Real. They never did anything like that. They, um, my, my dad was big into Navy books uh, and history. And my, my mom also, they were both huge on history. And uh, I had, I had a great library of things. Uh, the Irish really did when they came over, they had brought books with them. Okay. And so I was absolutely fascinated by everything in them and enjoyed them a great deal. So I wanted to write historical novels. I wanted to write contemporary novels. I wanted to write horror and I wanted to write thrillers. <laughs> so it was sometimes in the career, uh, you're not really sure if you've made the right choice or not. Um, because people will say, oh no, you need to brand yourself. You need to be a thriller writer. You need to be a horror writer, romance writer, whatever it may be. Um, but, and I don't know if I made right choices or not, but I, I always felt that you also needed to write what you love. And if there's a story in you, you know, that that's what you need to be looking into and doing. So well, I, 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 I've done different. <laughs> I would say that after having had 150 books published, of which I think there are over 75 million in print, I think you made the right choice. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, no, I hope so. I mean, uh, I consider myself blessed every day. I love what I'm doing. Um, I, you know, I've kind of groomed my oldest son. I probably will die with a manuscript in progress and you get to finish it. <laughs> you know, so... Um, I just, I love what I do. And I, uh, I don't, I think that I have survived. Not sure. That's would be, you know, a little bit of an aggressive word use there. I, I have not gotten mad at a million places where one has to wait because of books. I'm never too impatient. It's like, oh, good. I can get a couple chapters in. <laughs> oh, the doctor's running an hour and a half. Like, oh, whatever. Right. <laughs> so, so what is your writing routine? I, I don't have one at the moment, <laughs> yes, whenever I can, whenever I can. I was, uh, I am living with a three-year-old and uh, my, my daughter and, um, and a son. And so I'm just kind of uh, getting it in. My, when, when my husband <laughs> comes over to entertain, um, not that I mean, don't get me wrong, the three-year-old's great with her mom, but she also wants to inter interrupt whoever's there every other minute. So my husband's <laughs> there, he keeps her occupied. So. And then, you know, when people are sleeping, that's a good time. So, so you I also kind of figure. No, go ahead. I'll, I'll ask oh, you. No, I was going to say, because with five kids, every once in a while, I feel like I became a Dr. Seuss book. I can write on a plane. I can write on a train in a car going car. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you've never had a specific routine where you get up at this time and write till then, or it's more just when you can you do no, well i used to and when uh when the world's a little more normal yes. um i like mornings and i think it's because we did have five kids and the oldest is 13 years older than the youngest so for all those years i brought somebody to school at 7 a.m <laughs> right <laughs> so yeah so I, I i always liked seven um but if seven didn't work then there's the afternoon and I think to me, you know, we're, I know we're going to be talking about tips later, but to me, that is the most important thing is that uh, <laughs> you go back to the, you know, the John Lennon, life is what happens when you're busy making plans <laughs> and things will happen. You won't get to stick to your schedule. Then, you know, you just work around it. The only thing that I think of with scheduling is like things will happen. You may not work on schedule, but don't stop working. You know, right. just make sure you get back to it when you can. Uh, great advice. And please feel free to throw tips in it. Okay. <laughs> um, going back to when next we love. So how did you get that deal? Did you get an agent first? And no, oh, no, okay. no. <laughs> I bought writer's digest writer's market. Okay. Which I still recommend to everyone. Uh, they also have writer's digest agents market. Um, and for starting out too, I always think it's great to do your homework. You know, someone will ask me, oh, my God, who's the best agent? Well, there isn't a best agent. There's a best agent for you. Right. And, you know, you need to find out who that agent is, who's going to love you, who's going to work with you, who has put out. Um, it's so funny when you say similar, because, of course, you want books to be different. But someone who's working in the same type of, of novel who can really get it out there, know who the editors are, who's, who's right. buying that type of thing. 
So, and there's so much available online that you can look up today. <laughs> so, totally. But so, yeah, Go ahead. no, I was going to say that said, I adore my agent. I'm with the Aaron Priest Agency and Lucy Childs. Um, they have more than, I mean, I would, I would give them a bigger percentage because they are wonderful. Uh, I just love them to death. And I think I have a friend who was a bond attorney who became an author and she kept thinking she could do her own contracts. And then afterwards, nope, she went with an agent <laughs> because it's, it's different. It's its own, it's its own beast. And Okay, now sadly, this again dates me, but we've already said 1982. So <laughs> um, they're, they're just things that can happen because I actually remember when she said, no, 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 we're not giving away e-rights. And I was kind of like, well, what's an e-right? <laughs> so we don't know what twists and turns. Oh, yeah. um, there is so much out there. You know, you really need somebody who knows it. And I, I have friends too who... It can be a catch 24 because it's, I, I can't get into uh, this particular house because they want you to have an agent and I can't get an agent because they want you to have sold a book. So it can be really difficult, but there are places that do accept, you know, non-agented material. If I were doing it today and I made such a sale, I would still call the first agent that I had on my list of agents I'd like to have and then let them handle the sale, even though I've sold it myself. Right. Because you're not trying to sell a book, you're trying to have a career. That's right. You're absolutely right. So it was it right after you got the offer uh, for the book from the publisher that you went and got? No, I <laughs> know I learned the hard way. <laughs> no, because I had wanted to, uh, at the time, what I sold was a contemporary. And I had several historical ideas I had wanted to use. And I had a couple, you know, you know how we all are. I had a couple of things written. And um, in a trade magazine, an editor at uh, <clears throat> at the time it was, oh gosh, I'm forgetting what the trade, Pinnacle. And she had put in the magazine that she wanted people who wrote historicals with a voice like Heather Graham. And I'm kind of like, <laughs> wait, <laughs> I don't think I can do that. So <clears throat> then when I wanted to sell that, it was of course fine to do because I had had a contract for contemporaries. But that was when I got an agent because I didn't want to get sticky. You know, I want my relationships with the house to be good. Right. I, you know, I want somebody else to be, you know, getting in and making sure that everything is all set. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. Yes. Yeah. So, so you've written under a number of different names, under uh, your married name, your maiden name, <laughs> and under Shannon Drake. And I may have yeah. missed another, but I know of those three. No. No, those are those three. And uh, for my, my father-in-law was somebody I absolutely adored. He was one of the sweetest human beings I ever met. And uh, so I wanted to use my married name on something, but my married name is P-O-Z-Z-E-S-S-E-R-E. -E. And the art departments used to go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so they, would turn it, they would try to turn the letters into palm trees and things like that. So it was just very, very hard to use. And then of course, when I had started publishing, I definitely adored my own dad and Graham is yeah. my name. So I was using it. So and how did you pick Shannon Drake? How did you come up with that? <laughs> that one was kind of funny. I was told um, this, this was having, having gone with another company. And at the time people were pretty proud of her. Yeah. I'm not going to say that right. <laughs> people are, people were very, you know, they wanted their names for their house. And so she said, no, 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 you need a pseudonym. And I thought, Oh, okay. Well, how long do I have to think about that? And she said, well, you got about 60 seconds. Oh. So I looked up and two of my kids walked into the room and it was Shane and Derek. <laughs> oh, okay. So Shane and Derek became Shannon Drake. Cool. Do you, do you <laughs> have any advice for young writers, young authors who are deciding whether to write under their own name or to use a pseudonym? I, online, I, I keep seeing aspiring authors debating that issue. And I'm just wondering if you have any opinion or advice. Well, I think that, you know, um, especially sometimes I think when you do want to go into different genres, um, I think it can be good, but I think a play on the name that you have is, is often very good, something to do too. Um, you know, maybe uh, one you'd write as John Smith and another you would write as John 
Harold Smith. <laughs> you know, I mean, got it. <laughs> do a little play on it so that the people who do like what you're writing in one genre, who wish to look at it in another genre, may do that. So, I mean, please remember anything I say is my opinion, and of course. there's a million opinions out there. And that most of the time, when you listen to anybody, when you're at any convention, any conference, we're all different, and you have to kind of suck in what works for you. And like, no, I just can't do that. You know, so I mean, everybody has to do what's right for them too. Well, I'm also finding that uh, today, a lot of authors need to be very involved in the marketing of their books, even when yes. they're traditionally <laughs> published. And um, a lot of times the publishers want to use the person's backstory, uh, you know, if they've had an interesting life. And when you use a pseudonym, it's harder to do that uh, in, in some Probably. regard. So... I, I, I don't know. I, it's something I, you know, Blyweiss is not the easiest name in the world. And I was debating. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I decided, hey, people know me as that. And so I'm going with it. <laughs> well, I, I kind of like that too. I mean, because I, I like that we're such a, I don't know. I mean, this is kind of off books, but I just like that we're everything. And, and I love names being different. And I love when, oh, what is the background to that? You know, what is it? I think that's wonderful and fun. On the other side, I had somebody tell me once that nobody was going to ask for a book with the name Puts and Sandy on it because they weren't going to know how to say it. <laughs> so I was like, just ask for a bunch of Z's and S's. <laughs> so, but, um, but then again, it wasn't, it didn't, it didn't, you know, come into something like that for me because like I said, Graham, my dad's name and that's, you know, was right. the one that was important to me. Yeah. Cool. So. So, what's your favorite book that you've ever written? Do you have one? I have no idea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Probably the latest one. <laughs> oh, yeah. That, oh, that's, yes. That's what you're supposed to say. <laughs> the latest one. They have, I get on, I have a tendency to, because I, I, I seriously am just fascinated by, by history and events. So I think a lot of the time, um, I had a book come out in March, I believe it was called Danger in Numbers. Okay. And there'll be four in this series. And it is based on the, Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. It's uh, okay. it's not supernatural or paranormal. It's just straight. The uh, one protagonist is a uh, is an agent with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, and the other is an FBI agent. And uh, I like his background. Uh, she finds out that uh, one of the reasons that he's so intent on finding this particular strange set of killers is because he escaped from a cult. You know where things might have gone bad for him. I had done a great deal of reading on that, and I also used a lot of, um, I'm, I'm in uh, Coral Gables, Miami area, and I love the Everglades. I've spent a lot of time in the Everglades growing up, and okay. I find it fascinating. So I was able to use a lot of the Everglades, which I like. So um, I think a lot of it has to do with um, just really weird stories. I, I'm not going to think of the title now, but one of them down here in Key Largo, uh, there's a story about... Uh, a man who called himself Count von Cassel and a young lady named Elena de Hoyos. And uh, names. anyway, mm, yeah. Well, <laughs> anyway, he was he was German when he was a young boy. He had a dream about a beautiful dark haired girl. His grandmother told him that would be the true love of your life. Anyway, he got older. Um, you can look him up. Pictures of him are kind of creepy. And he wound up coming to Key West. In the meantime, there was, a, you know, we had a large Hispanic population down there then, fell in love with this beautiful Cuban girl who walked into radiology. He had a wife of his own at the time who was living in Zephyr Hills for some reason. Uh, and she was married, but as soon as he found out it was tuberculosis, he was out the door. Yes, you know, wow. in the early 19, earlier 1900s. So he convinced the family he could make her well, which of course he couldn't, she died. He got a, um, he had this, beautiful grave built for her in the Key West Cemetery, visited it every day for two wow. years, and then all of a sudden he stopped going. Seven years later, he's living in an airplane on the beach, and uh, somebody looked in the window of it trying to get a hold of him, and there was Elena de Hoyos in a wedding gown on his, <laughs> laid out on his bed. Wow. <laughs> so, and this is what's weird. It became known at the time, like it was in Parade Magazine, it was all over the country oh. as this great romance. Because at the time he, you know, they did mention things like, oh, he said he had married her and made her his wife in every way. <laughs> <So>. Oh. <laughs> um, 
she's she's definitely you know definitely in the Key West ghost stories. But I always thought if anybody was running around, <laughs> that poor girl deserved you know a second shot at what was going on. But they just they also you know they have pirate history down in Key West. They have all kinds of great history, and I think it's a lot of the time. Um, just when you're in a place, you know, the stories that you hear about, I mean, take Key West. It's right. kind of like, wait a minute, this man spent seven years buying mortician's wax, piano string, women's <laughs> garment, and no one noticed. Yeah, right. well, it's Key West. You know, right. we, don't, we don't ask what anybody's doing down in Key West, you know. So, but that's, I mean, I just, um, I love, I'll pick up on things. And in fact, you know, you're asking about the Shannon Drake. I recently went back. I guess it was about a year or so ago um, because we were being asked to do a lot of um, stories for COVID, which of course you want to help people. So we're doing stories, but whoever was doing it, whatever it was for, we're asking, oh my, you know, are we putting COVID in it or not putting COVID in it? And, you know, that became part of writing because mm -hmm. uh, obviously it's part of life. But anyway, I decided I'd seen a documentary. So I decided I was going to do a historical Arthurian fantasy. <laughs> Okay. Put it out to Shannon Drake. So Shannon Drake now has uh, it's called Daughter of Darkness and Light, oh. and so not to not to interrupt on the name that I have got with uh, Harper Collins. Um, it's I put it out there. Brilliance did pick it up, so it's on audio, which I'm very happy to say. Good. Um, but that but it's the kind of thing I think sometimes we have to write. You know, not that. You know, quite honestly, yes, I do this for a living. So, you know, I, I will definitely listen to people and, and what you need, what you want. Um, but it, it doesn't mean that we can't also express what we need to express. And right. sometimes, you know, maybe it'll pay. And, you know, sometimes you might keep it in the drawer and then 20 years from now, 40 years from now, next generation, somebody will find it. Yeah. You know? So well, I, I think we have to uh, go, go with our hearts and minds and then also be smart about what we're doing at the same time. Not always easy. Oh, you're, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. You know, I, I'm wondering, you, you've, uh, you've had 150 books out in just about, I guess it's close to 40 years now. This is all public knowledge. It's not like I'm reading a I know. <laughs> Damn but, Wikipedia. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but that, that's like four yeah. books a year. So yeah. I, you're very prolific. I mean, very prolific. And I mean, I know that like in May, you had the Unforgiven in July crew of, uh, of hunters, I think it is. Yeah. Um, and in September, you've got the unknown. And I think you had one in March. There's one in there. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, oh my God, I can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember my how, title. how long does it actually take you to write a book? Every single book is different. Every single one. It, it just, you know, for one, it, uh, depends on circumstances. And then for another, um, I really do look up everything I'm doing. So sometimes it depends on how much I'm having to look up. And right. then, which, can, which gets tricky sometimes because I know somebody was asking me, um, I had done, we were mentioning, I love Cairo. I had done a book years and years ago that took place in Cairo. And somebody asked me a question. I'm like, uh, <laughs> because we don't retain everything. Right. Um, but I'm, you know, but I'm, uh, when I'm doing something, it's like, I, in fact, this could be, I mean, we all know this could be a fault. It's like you look up something because you want to make sure it's right. And then you'll see a reference in there. And then you're looking up there and then you're looking, you know, <laughs> then you find yourself, you know, going on and on. And then of course, you know, we want to use what we need without coming up with the information dump, you know, and all that kind of thing. So it's tricky, but I, it just, I think everything always depends it's not a certain amount of time. And how do you write? Do, do the books just pop into your head and it's your job to transcribe them? Do you bullet point them from start to finish? Or what, what's your process in general? I think it depends on what it is. The, the Crew of Hunters series, I think is uh, kind of near and dear to me. And it's on book number 34. It will come out, I think, I'm not sure if 34 is the one that comes out in, what is August? One comes out in September. Yeah, there, there are three every every summer, right. and I think it, uh, I think it means an awful lot to me because, as I said, my mom from Ireland, and when I was a child, we used to go back up and spend time with her family, and I would spend a great deal of time with kind of a crazy, wonderful, uh, very strong little 
five foot, 80 pound woman <laughs> who uh, <laughs> was, was just fierce, but she had the best Irish legends known to man. And she, she had my sister and I convinced, uh, if you're not to be behaving, the banshees be getting you new hoops <laughs> and leprechauns and everything else. So she definitely gave us a, a love of the paranormal. And I remember my sister and I were teenagers before we were talking one day. And it's like, wow, she really scared us. We didn't have an outhouse, you know. <laughs> so she was just very good. But she was a great storyteller, a wonderful storyteller. And uh, I think she gave me my fascination with anything paranormal. Uh, but to me, if there is something, uh, you know, if, if the things we believe in many different religions, right. um, if there, there could be something out there, perhaps the soul does live on, you know, and if it lived on, there are, the other thing to me is that there are certain places, um, like standing on the battlefield at Gettysburg, and I don't know, is the ground just seeped with history? Uh, what is it that gives you this sense of what went on? You know, how do you get all that? So um, have I ever met a ghost? No. Um, we had, my sister, after my dad had passed away one time, my sister and I were talking and we were like, you know, do you think dad would ever come back? And he's like, no, no, because he knows that if he popped up on one of us, we'd have a heart attack and die. <laughs> so, um, but uh, do I think things are possible? I don't know. But on that vein, I have friends who are the Peace River ghost trackers and I've gotten to do some fascinating things with them. So um, I, I would say my mind is open. Well, no, that, that, that's great. I, um, I did a column about a building here in Ashland, Oregon, where I, where I live. And, really? Yeah. Yes, and it's a haunted building. And I was shown videos and, and heard audios of little girls that weren't there calling out for their mothers and oh, things wow. like that. And uh, there are ghosts who regularly appear in this building during functions and meetings. And it was fascinating. I, I wrote a great, I think a great column. Oh, wow, I gotta read, I gotta read. <laughs> I gotta I'll read send it. it to you, <laughs> it's interesting. Well, that's just, I mean, I never go to a city where I don't go on the ghost tour. Okay. Um, and then, uh, I belong to horror writers and they have a, a conference in the in Northeast, Eastern United States. It's been in Rhode Island. I think we're moving to Massachusetts when we're able to move again. Right. But a group of us every year would go and stay. The last night we would go and stay at the Lizzie Borden house. We would just take the whole house. And, and that was, was fascinating, especially too, because of the arguments, you know, like, trust me, if somebody's haunting the place, it's not Lizzie because she hated it. <laughs> you know, she would be haunting elsewhere. Um, but I think one of the things that, that would get me is they had there were to get to the rooms upstairs. There were they it was the houses divided was at the time. I don't know if it's changed hands. That Lizzie and her sister went up, and then the one that the parents went up. And one time when we were staying there, I had a couple of my kids, and we were in a room over here, but my room was actually over here. And so I had to go get the computer for them to play with. And I remember going downstairs at night, and I wasn't thinking that I was being creeped out by the fact that, okay, it's dark, <laughs> but she, the, the woman uh, had just kept it beautifully. Just not the furniture that was there, but she found period furniture that was pretty precise, you know, to what had been. And she also had headless mannequins <laughs> was man wearing period <laughs> clothing. I, uh, some of the outfits Elizabeth Montgomery had worn, Cherokee wow. Bewitched, oh, cool. and that, that actresses had worn playing Lizzie Borden. Um, and actually, that was really fun. I got to bring some of the theater back in it. Biography was filming there one time, and apparently there'd been mixed communications, and I thought that they were someone from HarperCollins, and they thought that I was their actress. Um, so <laughs> it wound up. I was just trying to tell her, this This was maybe 10 years ago, and I was trying to tell her, I don't think I would be Lizzie, <laughs> but I had my daughter there who had just gotten out of Cal Arts, oh, so it's like, okay. okay, she became Lizzie, and she, oh, and this, somebody's got a great ghost story out there, because she was Lizzie, and she was hacking me up as Abby, so. <laughs> okay. I was going to say, how many kids get to do that? Come on, seriously. <laughs> but they, I think she was more nervous was because of course they had a wooden block for her with the hatchet and then the uh, filmmaker stopped at one point because he told them oh no 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 we have to stop and, and the, the director was wait a minute everything was going fine he goes no no look at your hatchet 
Well, they had borrowed the hatchet from me and, and it had this giant uh, welcome written on it. <laughs> so they figured, no, that wasn't gonna work. So they did them again, but then they asked me if I wanted to throw stage blood on China. And I was like, oh, you bet. <laughs> yeah, we'll throw something out. So afterwards they're setting up for their next shot and she's in this gown with this blood all over her and she's walking up and down in front of the window. And all of a sudden from the street, you hear, <sighs> you know, looked at the window and there's this family running away. And I thought they are going to believe the rest of their days that they definitely saw a ghost. <laughs> I'll bet. <laughs> but, it, but it's fun. That's what I mean. The, um, I've, I've gotten to do the Queen Mary with the Peace River Ghost Trackers, the uh, Spanish Military Hospital in St. Augustine. Like, you know, just done a lot of wonderful things with them. And I love them because they go in and try to find out, is it electricity? Right. You know, is it this? Is it something happening? They look for every plausible explanation. Then if they don't find it, they don't, they're not like, oh yeah, it's definitely a ghost. They're like, there is no plausible explanation, yeah. you know, that they can, they can find. So I, I truly enjoy them. I, I just love getting to do things with them. Although one time we were at the Spanish military hospital, and of course they have cameras everywhere, you know, the bank of screens set up. And I was looking at the screens and I saw this large, dark shadow appearing. And I called one of the guys over and I'm like, my God, what is that? What is that? And he goes, well, that would be Scott's shadow because he's walking across the room. <laughs> so it's like, okay. So no, I did not. But but there have been places where you feel something. You oh, know yeah. what I mean? Like oh, I do. Back to, yeah, I totally definitely. Do. Yeah. So, so talking about acting, uh, how often do you get confused with the actress, Heather Graham? <laughs> well, Sadly, um, sadly, I had the name first and I was born Heather Elizabeth Graham. She was born Heather Joan Graham. But I was in New Orleans one time doing the local station. And okay, I did do, <laughs> I, I don't, I seriously have made myself forget the title of this. I was in the world's worst Kung Fu movie. It was really, really bad. Um, we made some money on it because every time the hero did a flip, they had to tape his toupee back on. So it was, when I say world's worst, I am, not, I am not kidding. So I sat down with the interviewer and she was smiling and laughing. She said something to me about, well, how did that movie go? And I'm like, oh my God, how did this woman find that movie? I'm like, oh, you know, like that. And so we were talking several minutes and then I am kind of brought up something about books. And then she was, you know, it just, we, we very luckily skewed, but the producer had changed since they had set up the interview. Okay. <laughs> so the on-air hostess thought that she was interviewing <laughs> the actress <laughs> Heather Graham. So, so that was interesting. But that was that was probably, um, and then a couple of times at BEA, you know, I would get somebody running up, and they're like, "Oh my God, I gotta have a picture with you." I'm like, "Yeah, go ahead." <laughs> you know, I don't think I'm quite what you want, but whatever. <laughs> well, you're both so, very attractive women, so I can see. Oh well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I said, I've got her by a few years, so they, you know, <laughs> but that's okay. Yeah. So I, I understand that you do um, a lot of charitable work. Um, in, uh, well, I have, yeah, I have a couple of favorites, um, say, uh, St. Jude's, Shriners Hospital, um, but I, I guess mostly um, uh, for years we would do a, do a vampire ball at, uh, at the Romantic Times Convention and, and make our, our proceeds there would go to pediatric AIDS because oh, vampires blood. <laughs> so yeah, we right. thought that that should happen. And uh, I, I think one of the things that I've done that has been most fun for me and rewarding, and of course one no, doesn't know what will happen now, but years ago after Katrina, I, I think I have always spent a great deal of time in New Orleans and a friend of mine who owned a carriage company at the time uh, was saying that they you know, kind of got hurt by the federal government, the state government, the parish government, yep. but that the American people were wonderful, um, but they didn't want handouts. They wanted to get back to work okay. and to get back to work, they needed people to come in. And so she talked me into having a, a convention and or conference, I should say, because it's far. Right. And I, I remember too, my sister, um, I'd lost my sister, but she had gone to Jazz Fest every single year and she loved the Monteleone and we picked the Monteleone because it was a New Orleans hotel. Right. And I was trying to tell her, you know, you know maybe we can get, you know, 150 or 200 people in here. And I, I don't know if that's going to fix New Orleans. And she just gave me the, no, because your friends who come 
will tell their friends that right. they can come back. Right. You know, and you can start a whole thing going. So we involved the libraries and uh, uh, we did, people were wonderful. You know, people came in and you know, we had the kind of schedule set up where you would have you know, your authors speaking and then right. you know, they would have to, lunch was a big break. So you'd go out and spend money at a New Orleans restaurant. That's and, good. Um, Love the Monteleone, we found out later. Uh, it's still family owned. And uh, I believe the gentleman who owned it at the time has, has got younger family taking care of it now. But during Katrina, when his workers couldn't pay an electric bill, all they had to do was bring it to him. Oh. So I couldn't have been happier to have put my business yeah. there. Um, so, I mean, I, I hate to say, I don't hate to say I give so much because I get so much back from it. You know I mean? that It was so much fun. Um, we, we had David Morell speak for uh, Sandra Grant and Tasha. We spoke together. That was, that was true. We, we just had, uh, we've had wonderful people come and help. So um, now it's funny because a friend of mine, Connie Perry, who helped me put this all together and uh, is, is uh, my assistant. She's from Lafayette. So New Orleans was easy for her. But one time we were in line somewhere, we're kind of whining about being in line. And then it was, wait a minute, we wanted lines back. <laughs> you know, that's what we were trying to do. So. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping all of us, you know, make a good comeback from everything that's happened in the last couple of years. That's, that's going to be hard for all of us too. It, it is, but I, I share your sentiments totally. So tell me about something else you do too, the slush pile players. <laughs> <laughs> well, we put on, let's say, I think our, I think the slush piles last performance was at VoucherCon last year. And uh, we do, uh, <laughs> we do murder mystery dinner theater. I gotta make you know the years in college pay somehow. <laughs> right. <laughs> we all, we also have a slush pile band. Uh, the horror writer F. Paul Wilson is uh, an amazing guitarist. We have David Morrell, Daniel Palmer, you know, and a number of other people. Uh, Don Brooms has come in and out. We've had a number of authors. Um, so I, I guess it's kind of old authors garage band. <laughs> <laughs> How often do you gig? Uh, when we can, okay. you know, when we can, and then of course it always depends on who can be at what function. Right. Um, our, our dinner theater last year was hysterical and a great deal of fun. We had Charlene Harris and uh, let's see, Daniel. Um, it, like I said, it just, you know, oh, it's revolved, the cast kind of revolves around who's there and who's willing to be a guinea pig and, and get on stage with, you know, 20, less than 24 hours of rehearsal. You know, <laughs> whoever will do that for you. I'd certainly be willing to do it if we're ever in the same place. All right. The time you're doing. Yeah, uh, I do have a long memory for certain things. So oh, no, that's okay. I, I was a professional guitarist and bass player. So oh, I, well, you're in. <laughs> you're in. I didn't say I was good. I just said I was professional. <laughs> no, serious. Our motto is you don't have to be good. You just have to have fun. That, well, I'll tell you how it, it was funny <laughs> how it started off because when Thriller first started, um, a, a gentleman, uh, Levinson, who had done a lot of the hosting in California for various different pageants and everything was a, a member. And he had put together the Killer Thriller Band. And at the time, I, I think it was a, a 10, 10 men. And then Harley Jane Kozak, uh, the, the, the actress and writer, the real one. <laughs> and um, Alexandra Sokoloff and I were the, the kind of like the three three singers, tap dancers, <laughs> whatever you had. And so that kind of became too cumbersome to be able to go up with the awards. But, you know, but then so afterwards, we kind of skewed into, um, well, I mean, I'd already, I'd already been doing the dinner theaters and things, but that, that kind of sucked them into it. <laughs> so, it. <laughs> so we had a lot of fun. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. A shout, shout out to Daniel Palmer. I mean, he's done things at Thriller too. He's an amazingly talented writer uh, and, and musician and just good guy. Excellent. So you started something called the Writer's Challenge Game. How did, how did that start? And what does somebody have to do to be an entrant in the Writer Challenge oh. Game? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not really a contest and let, you know, unless it happens to, to come up at, at, that, at an event, but uh, it's something uh, that's, that's just a lot of fun because every once in a while, all of us feel bogged down. We're not sure where we're going, you know, and question, you know, our ability and everything like that. And it's just, it's a game. And I believe it's up on the website. You get a sentence to start off. Now you can take that sentence into any genre you want. Um, even when the sentence is often, the blood drips slowly down the wall. 
But believe it or not, you can take that into high school comedy because it's stage blood and I'm supposed right. to be on the person, you know, and instead it's right. on the wall. Okay. Um, one, of, one of my friends with it did, um, well, it comes with more than just a sentence. You get three nouns, you get three um, adjectives, three three verbs, and you, you have to use them, you know, on, on your pages, but okay. they don't have to be the protagonist or the whatever. But it's just how, how people can take these things into different directions is another friend, Kathleen Catalano, took it into a zombie story because she was a zombie, but she'd become a vegetarian because she was in love with a human. <laughs> the zombies next door kept throwing the refuse over the fence, uh, really trying to irritate her. And she was going to like go over and just have a good conversation and make them stop it because she was a vegetarian, you know, because of a good human right. husband. However, when she went over to talk to the neighbor, she found out that her good human husband was having an affair with the wife. And so she decided she would just eat his brains and the heck with this vegetarian stuff. <laughs> but I mean, you can take it into Great. so many different directions. Um, and a lot of people who have done it have gone on to publish the story. So, you know, various cool. anthologies and things. Cool. So it's a fun thing to do. It just, it, it gives you just certain elements and then you take them wherever you want to go. And then I think you can realize that when you're working on your own stories or your own book, this is the element I want to go with. And then you add this and then you add this and you know, it just goes somewhere. So, so it's what, fun. what are you working on now? I, or how many books? And <laughs> <laughs> right now, <coughs> excuse me, I'm working on proof for, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, proof for 2022. Okay. So, and this time I'm using, uh, it's, it's always this, this uh, uh, crew of hunters is kind of like, my, my favorite thing is it's been called Criminal Minds Made Supernatural. So, but it is, it is based on people who really have to go to the FBI Academy. Um, and I'm super grateful to thriller writers for that because we used to go to the FBI once a year in New York City, you oh, know, cool. and, 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 and get to learn from, I was amazed at how many people would come in to talk to us, but the FBI actually wants to be warm and cuddly Really? Because if they need your help, they don't want you going, oh, the FBI. You know, they want, yeah. you know, they want, they want your help. So <laughs> they were incredible on the information they gave us. So, and then, but since my people, um, they wind up together because they are part of the infinitesimal percentage who can see and speak to the dead when the dead be seen and spoken to. Um, and then, but this, this, uh, this one, this series, this for the, it's they, they all stand alone, but these right. books these years make use of triplets who okay. have other little strange quirks that go along with their ability to see the dead. So okay, cool. Yeah. And then I watch a lot of documentaries. <laughs> so so uh, most most of my wacky killers are based on real ones. Okay, cool. So you and I both have stories in an upcoming. Uh, short story anthology, Hotel California, that'll be coming mm -hmm. out next May. Tell, tell me about the story you wrote for the book. I'm trying to remember. <laughs> I can always edit this out. <laughs> um, no, no, What's, what, what, tell me about your story. Um, well, my, my story features a, um, a New York hitman named Walker who ends up uh, having instead of he's sent to do a hit and instead it's a hit on his life and he escapes and goes to uh, Hawaii where he is pursued by the hit person that was after him and it's kind of the cat and mouse story of who's going to get who. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> this sounds good. This sounds good. It's definitely a departure from the 1910 English countryside that I'm writing with Scorpion, but you know, it's, it's no, but quite interesting. <laughs> I, I love short stories because of that. You know, you, you take, you can kind of take off on, uh, you know, on anything that you want to do. I actually do. Most of these are available on my website too. And I, they'd be up free on Amazon if I could figure out how to make them free, but they're 99 cents on Amazon. <laughs> I do holiday stories and they're really, Thank you gifts to readers. They go out with the reader letter. Okay. Um, but I have I have the best time with them because I take characters that I've used in the crew and put them into other situations. 
some of them, which are um, nice, you know, they, they, you know, wind up with, with good things happening on holidays or things like that, or um, solving something for somebody else on a holiday. But they're based around holidays most of the time. Okay. And then, uh, cool. Yeah, I've seen some of those in the list of books. I mean, is it, I, I've printed out a list of all of the <laughs> and, uh, stories and everything you've written. It, it almost made my pen, printer run out of ink. <laughs> <laughs> it, I, I saw the holiday stories and things like that on there. Yeah, it, you're very uh, wide ranging. I mean, historical fiction, horror, romance, uh, romance, suspense, time travel, vampires, Christmas. I mean, I, it keeps life interesting, I, I guess. <laughs> Oh, I have a sci-fi too. I did a sci-fi with John Land called The Rising. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The second one uh, I think is coming out next year, Blood Moon. Yeah, I, I have a great time. Um, John John Land's terrific. We have a great time together. He's a good friend and a funny, funny man. So we have a, we have a good time working together. Oh, that's um, great. That, that's absolutely yeah. great. So um, I think we're kind of running toward the end of the time that we have and I was wondering if there's anything that you want to talk about that I haven't brought up or asked, and uh, then we'll get to what your top tip for aspiring writers might be. Um, I, I think you've been pretty great. I'm trying to think of, um, just, I do, um, I guess I'll go into tip because that's part of the okay. too. Is sure. I do, obviously, our last couple of years have been very difficult, Otherwise, I do recommend, um, I love my local romance group. I love my local mystery group. I love Mystery Writers of America. I, I mean, I love all my groups right. um, because I think we all give so much to each other. So I really recommend people um, to, be, you know, uh, go to lunch or something. Maybe if it's not for you, don't do it. You know, I mean, I'm sure groups are different all across the country too. Right. So, but for whatever you're writing, look into that. There's uh Again, I, this, this is something we've mentioned to each other. I don't know um, a more giving, nicer group of people. And I think one of the things that's, because uh, I, I think R.L. Stein was always a hero of mine. Nicest man you ever want to meet. You know, most giving, most generous human being. Charlene Harris, True Blood, she is, she's just, she's so sweet. Maybe one day we're going to prove that like she is so nice because she is alien. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but I mean, writers are giving. Um, if, you know, you may have a piece of information somebody else needs and a lot of people who belong to say mystery writers, art police, art in forensics, you know, can give you the little bit that you need. And they're, they tend to be wonderfully generous. And as I said, I'm, I cover my bases. I belong to everything. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just, I find everybody to be so generous and it's just great. Um, we are, no one person is ever going to write as we were figuring out thousands of books a month. Right. Um, you know, we're always, we should, not because of any type of competition, but because of what we do, we should always be striving to work our best and put out our best project. Oh, okay, that I'll give you no. <laughs> okay. I think self-publishing is great, but I want you to remember what publishing entails. Publishing means that a book is line edited, you know, for content, for story, for everything like that. It is copy edited for right. grammar, for, you know, conciseness, for everything. Uh, it usually has some type of marketing and it's going to have some advertising and it's going to have some care, whether everybody's in love with it or not, with what the cover art is going to be. Like there's, there's so much behind publishing. There's making sure always, whether you do it or someone else does it, that it's your best work. Very few people just want to sell one book. Most people right. want to make it a career. And so you always want to put your best foot forward. This does not mean that even with major companies, there aren't mistakes in books. There are, there always will be. Uh, human error is not going to be erased. Uh, but the, the concept is to do the best that you can. Right. And that way, when it's the best that you can, somebody's going to ignore the one typo on page 99. Yes, although I will tell you a short, quick anecdote. Uh, back when I was in the music industry, I was very uh, friendly with Ronald Bellow's Cool of Cool in the Gang. And Ronald uh, told me that they purposefully put a mistake in every record they made. Because, really? Yes, he said, because their religion believes that only God can be perfect. So you oh. can't have everything you do be perfect. Oh, wow. 
Interesting. Just curious, did you did you ever uh, meet or uh, have occasion to work with the Rhodes Brothers? No, no. Okay. I worked back up for them for a long time. Oh, really? <laughs> I got to back up, do theater, and bartend all in one. <laughs> <laughs> so if you weren't, I, I'm not going to end yet. I want to ask you this. If you, your career ended up not being a writer, would you have wanted to have been an actress or a singer or a musical theater singer actress what what, what could you all of the above all of the above okay i will still go to every live performance i can i i just i love live theater love music so yeah I've, and uh yeah <laughs> we obviously you know we are we are we are <laughs> putting on uh you know golden globe performances but we have a lot of fun when we do do our little shows and things at various conferences and conventions well, um, and the band is right and the idea our, our motto was always um you don't have to be good you have to have fun and want to work with others that's yeah. the whole yeah i i believe in that great well this has been wonderful i hope you've enjoyed it oh, thank you <laughs> oh no i've had a great time and i found another guitarist <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you play both you play lead and bass I, I, I'm, yeah, I play bass very well. I, I spent okay. 10 to 15 years on the road as a bassist. Uh, but I also, I play probably better rhythm guitar than lead guitar, but I do okay. play some lead guitar and I have a home recording studio and I've been doing some recording. Okay, he do know this is all being, you know. <laughs> I'm sorry, say it again. Oh, no, 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 no. Yes, this this is all up here. You oh, know. oh, yes. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I love I, it. I wouldn't want to say I use my friends. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you can't use your friends. Who can you use? <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for spending thank you. time. And uh, good luck on all of the books you've got coming out. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. It's been great. It's been great to get to talk to you. So. Yes, same here. Absolutely. <laughs> okay.